Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining us today. This is uh, an endorsement interview for Metro uh, District 5 with Mary Nolan, Mary Pivoto, and Cameron Witten. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll just start off by having each of the candidates briefly, like one or two minutes, uh, talk about why you're running for office um, and why you think you're the best person for this position. And just to go in alphabetical order, um, if Nolan, if you can start, that would be great. Be happy to, thank you. Um, and thank you all for taking time on a Friday afternoon to visit with us. Um, I'm Mary Nolan. I'm running for Metro Council um, because as I look at the region, Metro has the opportunity to provide the glue to hold the region together on really important issues around livability, around economic prosperity, um, and around equity across the region. I bring a lot of deep experience in legislative work, and the Metro Council is essentially a legislative body. Its job is to set policy and to set budgets. And I bring deep experience in both of those um, at the legislature for 12 years, including as co-chair of the Ways and Means Committee, really balancing a multi-billion dollar budget with deep and, and contentious uh, competition among compelling needs, as well as important policy issues. Um, but what I really want to bring to Metro is a focus on disrupting the complacency and really moving us forward in ways that voters can actually recognize and that give them a reason to think that what Metro's doing matters, um, that any investments they make in Metro deliver actual results that you can count, that you can measure, that people can say, yep, that's what I supported and that's and important to me that you're actually following through on that. I have deep, deep experience in doing that. Metro has uh, an expanding portfolio of responsibilities. Some of those things Metro has added of its own initiative, and some of them, as you all have um, uh, weighed in on, have been brought to Metro and asked, and, and they've been asked to expand their capacity partly because of the opportunity to do that coordination, and let's be blunt, partly because of their capacity to uh, collect revenue across the entire region. Um, what I think they need are sophisticated negotiators, sophisticated leaders, who can both learn from opposing points of view and who can be candid and effective with allies um, and essentially saying no to your friends, um, which is really one of the hardest parts of being an effective elected leader. Um, it's easy to say no to the folks who disagree with you. It's really hard to say no to your friends and allies when you realize that some of the expectations, some of the requests are not feasible or not supported by a majority of the voters or the council. So I bring that level of enthusiasm, that level of concrete results that I've delivered, both in public office and as an executive in private businesses and in nonprofits, and an energy to find solutions that resonate with voters and that can justify the investment and trust that they make in Metro. Thank you. Um, and Mary, if uh, you wouldn't mind going next. Thank you. And it's so nice to put some faces with names here <laughs> that I see in my email box or on my paper every day. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity and the opportunity to tell you why I want to run for Metro Council or why I'm running for Metro Council, which really is because I have been an effective change maker in a system that, um, you know, I was astounded, you know, uh, when I started my work 10 years ago on air quality um, to see a political system that was so out of step with the values of the people that I understood the values of the people in the community in Oregon to be, and to try and figure out why and unpack that. And I'm really proud of the success that um, I have had 
uh, and our organization has had to move forward on really big issues and key problems that many people in this district care deeply about, which is air quality and climate and healthy communities. And, but we had to do a lot of that at the state legislature, and that was a really frustrating um, place to do work. Um, in many ways, I didn't understand why, frankly, until um, your uh, publication uh, published the story "Polluted by Money." Started to really understand to understand the um, the entrenched influences in that state in our state politics. But that said, I'm actually incredibly proud. I think one of the things that um, we did effectively was to go into the, the legislature. And actually, it is hard to say no to your friends. Sometimes it's even harder to say yes to your enemies or who you perceive to be. And I think that we actually built a strong coalition, not only of grassroots advocates, but we actually were able to build um, a strong support across many variety of interests to move forward on two of the biggest environmental wins, I think, in the last couple decades in Oregon. Um, so in the 2018 session, being able to get a polluter fee funded whole new air quality, air emissions regulation program um, passed uh, in the state legislature was a massive win for all of Oregonians. And I think actually a lot in the business community agree because when we see a total collapse of our institutional institutions like regulators, um, that doesn't serve any of us well. And then following up in 2019, being able to push the diesel bill forward, which again broke two decades of opposition and, and no movement on an issue that everybody wildly recognized as one of our leading environmental health and environmental justice issues. So I'm really proud of that track record, but I will say I was not inspired to, to go there and work. I was inspired by metro regional, regional governance. I was inspired by things like the uh, housing construction bond that was passed in 2018, where through regional governance and collaboration across broad interest groups, we could actually move on one of our single biggest issues facing the livability of our region. And when I started this race, I was very motivated because I thought that what made me very optimistic about getting engaged on the transportation package, which for me as an air quality and environmental and person who's deeply committed to the climate, the transportation package represents potentially the best tool in the toolkit. It's, it's transportation is 40% of our, our um, con contribution to climate, to greenhouse gas, to carbon and air quality problems. So I see huge opportunity again through the collaborative process of, of regional governance to actually make good and effective solutions and move forward on these really intract, what have seemed like intractable problems. So that was my motivation, was seeing an area of governance that really works. It works at the scale that we need it, which is big enough, but it works, it, it really seems to cut through the problems that we're having in Salem that are so polarized and so entrenched in money and politics that we can't seem to actually get back to good governance. And I think we can still do that at the regional level and carry the values of our community. And I'm really excited about the opportunity that that represents. And we have a whole new crisis. Um, and I think that that is going to be, proved to be our most important um, level of government is local action on the new crisis. Okay, thank you. Um, Cameron. Thanks, Ellen. And thanks to all of the editorial board members who are joining us here today for this conversation. My name is Cameron Witten. I'm a community activist. I'm a nonprofit executive. I'm a small business owner and I'm a candidate for Metro Council District 5. And I'm running for Metro Council because I don't want to see Portland become just another overpriced West Coast city. At one point, I was a 18 year old homeless youth on the streets of Portland. I have seen personally the deep disparities here in this society, but I've also seen the best of Portland. I have seen the generosity of people and organizations that provided resources and support so that I and others like me could find housing, find employment, and ultimately define our own futures. Ever since that moment, I have been pursuing my life calling, which is giving back to others because I have personally seen the difference that it makes. But we have a crisis facing this region. The main reason why I got into this race was because of my passion and track record on affordable housing. And now with the shockwaves of this pandemic, it's obvious that we need action on affordable housing now more than ever. 
but we also have to address growing inequality, our looming climate emergency, and the fact that our communities are more diverse than ever, and yet we are seeing our institutions and policies stagnate and leave people behind. As our regional government, Metro could be poised to deliver bold solutions on our most critical issues. But to be that bold leader with bold solutions, we need leadership that is effective, progressive, and represents the lived experiences of the people who live in our district. If elected Metro Council, I will bring more than a decade of Portland grown leadership, both lived and executive. I have been a grassroots hunger striker. I have gone to Salem and passed landmark legislation around housing. I have uh, been, sat on advisory committees around transportation with TriMet, City of Portland. I have sat on the boards of multi-million dollar nonprofits, and I've been a nonprofit executive, both as a transition manager, but also collaborating and including partners from across our region to better help this community. This is the type of leadership that Metro needs and our district needs. Great. I'm Thanks. so grateful to have the support of over 150 people who've endorsed our uh, community leaders and organizations who've endorsed my campaign. And it speaks to the vision that I will bring as Metro Counselor, working with a diverse coalition to make sure that Portland has an economy that works for all, that we have bold and effective leadership on affordable housing, and that we take action on climate in a way that includes and uplifts our entire community. Uh, we are facing an uncertain future. And I have shown with both my lived experience and my professional experience that I can take uncertainty, I can take an obstacle and turn that into a platform that moves everyone forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great, we'll just jump into questions and uh, uh, probably just start off with a different person each time. So this will be for, uh, I guess first will be Mary Pivoteau. Um, and the first question I have is, Metro announced last month that it is, it's laying off 40% of its staff. Um, due to lower garbage revenue and the closures of its event venues, Metro's revenue has dropped by more than $11 million a month. If you were on the council right now, what other actions would you take to position Metro to get through this economic crisis? I think that's an excellent question. I, I think what it really represents to me is that we have a, a government entity that is as deeply enmeshed in the economic reality of most of the region and the businesses of the region. And I do think that Metro has an opportunity um, to look at any recovery and any investments in recovery as looking at those workers first that it had to lay off because they are they are the heartbeat of our city they they you know metro's involvement as you said you mentioned the um uh the convention center and the performing arts centers and the zoo i mean these are all in those same community gathering spaces that that so many of our businesses have had to shut down because are right now um, untenable to be open. And so Metro is very enmeshed, I think, in the same experience that so many of our businesses are going through. And I think how it leads and deals with the workers that are being displaced from those will be a model for the region. And I think that we need to be looking at investments, not only as a safety net for those workers, <laughs> And how we protect them and make sure that they're not going to add to the you know uh the the deep economic and unhoused population um because too many of those 40 percent of those the workforce was um lowing the lower wage positions and people of color so we know that they're also living on a close edge with um with dropping into uh really dire circumstances um, but Metro also, even as its garbage revenue and other things have gone down, it still has frontline workers there. It still has essential services it's providing. So how are we as Metro, are we, are we doing what we're saying everybody should be doing, which is taking care of those workers who are essential and who are on the front lines and still having to do their jobs? Are they getting the pay compensation and the protective um, measures that they should be having? So. So I think that it's going to be about the values we hold when the money starts coming back and we can start making investments. I think it's really going to be about how Metro um, invests those in values that are worker, family, wage, job, you know, uh, investments first and, and really leading as a model for the region of how we bring back this economy. 
Thank you. Um, Cameron, if you wouldn't mind going next. Um, and basically the question is that Metro uh, just announced it's laying off 40% of its staff, et cetera. Um, and what would you do? What steps would you consider to, to position Metro to get through this crisis? It's, it's a great question. And my first job as an executive director of a nonprofit, um, I was in a unique situation where uh, the organization owed the IRS three times as much as it had in its bank because of a payroll tax liability. And so uh, these kind of financial situations are not new to me. And uh, it is tragic what's happening right now with this pandemic. I was originally born in New Jersey. You know, I learned this morning that uh, one of my aunts died because of the virus, and uh, I'm sure she won't be the last one. So we are in a time of severe crisis. Um, and the reality is, is that this is the time when we need government to rise to the occasion and do its job, which is protecting our community. And so it's a really tough situation because we did not expect to be where we are today. But we have to acknowledge that we're in a crisis and we have to do di things differently in a crisis. And that means making hard decisions. We already saw it happen with the 40% layoff of workers. I have disagreements with how it was done. I believe that folks should get a two weeks notice. I think if not, get a severance. I think there are better ways to do layoffs, but that doesn't discount the fact that we still are looking at a really tough financial future. And that does mean that we're closing venues. That means that we are examining furloughs. We have to make those really hard decisions. Um, and the thing is that Metro is not alone. We are all in this time and this is all very hard, but I believe that Metro did a great job in hiring Marisa Madrigal as COO. Uh, she is new to the job, so it is important that uh, Metro leadership is also involved in providing that support and making those tough decisions. Uh, but I do believe that we need to continue to evaluate the situation. You know, advocating for support from the state and federal government is important. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to make sure that we are uh, doing what we can to make sure that Metro is a thriving and resilient organization. So you know, we're looking through our budgets. We're looking through projections. As you said, $11 million a year, a month that is currently being lost. Uh, potentially, that could get worse. And so it means that instead of making you know, an annual budget or even a month budget, you're really looking at things week by week. And so I believe that we, that means that the budget comes first. You have to evaluate that and be agile as much as possible. Uh, but at the same time, you know, having values of transparency and fairness is important. And so how do you balance all those things is the kind of lens that I'll be bringing based off of my professional experience. Great. Thank you. And Nolan, how about you? What, uh, what, actions would you suggest uh, for helping Metro weather this economic storm? Well, I'd like to approach your question, Helen, um, with two time frames. One is what should have been in place and therefore what needs to be in place for the next disaster and crisis. And I'll talk about that in a bit because it's frankly appalling that Metro was so ill prepared to deal with um, a disruption like this. No one might have predicted this particular crisis, but the lack of really serious and um, planned out um, economic as well as response uh, capability um, is something that I'd like to address as a member of the council. Um, but I'd like to also acknowledge that of the people who've been left, who've been laid off or furloughed, um, the burden has fallen not just way disproportionately on people who are at the lowest wage level of Metro employees, um, but it really um, jeopardizes the progress Metro had made, um, admirable progress it had made in making sure that its workforce reflected the diversity of the population it serves. The burden of these furloughs and layoffs will fall disproportionately also because of the way they've been implemented on employees from communities of color, which I think um, Metro could have and might still be able to make some adjustments and um, mitigate that impact. Um, I don't know how much opportunity they have, but had I been on the council now, I would have really looked at that um, recognition of 
collective bargaining agreements and honoring those should have been a guiding uh, principle. I'm pretty sure it actually played into their decisions. But also looking at this from the perspective of its, you know, if its efforts to diversify its workforce were authentic, then that needs to be a factor, not just in who we hire, but how we compose our workforce when we hit a, a, dis, a disruption like this. And I think Metro should have and may still be able to look at that. Um, so back to the emergency planning. I have experience both at the municipal level, City of Portland, and at the state level in my role as co-chair of the Ways and Means Committee in facilitating emergency preparedness plans. In fact, at the City of Portland, I led the bureau that was the front line for emergency response um, in the Public Works Department. And we had a plan. We knew how to implement it. Um, not just for deployment of uh, the workforce, but also for sustaining as much of the workforce as we could. At the state, I led um, the legislative participation in the updating of the statewide emergency preparedness plans. And I don't pretend, nor do I want to have this position be the technical expert to develop those plans. But I do think someone with the experience of having done them can play a key role in framing the question and pushing for a really um, robust, responsible, doable emergency preparedness plan for Metro so that we don't get caught off guard the next time some natural disaster or medical disaster or economic disaster hits our region. Um, I, just to go into that a little bit more, like what are some of the elements that would, would go into that, that Metro, um, that you think Metro should have had? Well, for example, one of the things we did at the state was to consciously organize how we might share resources, equipment, funding, and personnel among jurisdictions. When you're in crisis, jurisdictional lines should evaporate. If Metro, and Metro, I will give Metro Credit, they opened up the convention center to be a temporary shelter, but they have other facilities, they have other equipment, and they certainly have personnel that had they had in place intergovernmental agreements to deploy those people could have mitigated some of these, some of the harsh reality that this imposed on um, the workers at the venues and at the solid waste transfer station. And I agree with Nolan. The reality is, is that, you know, five years ago, Bill Gates said in a TED talk that we aren't ready for the next pandemic. And unfortunately he was right. And we have seen Metro uniquely impacted by this with 40% of our workforce laid off. Metro, once this pandemic is over, Metro really needs to be a leaning convener around how do we recover our economy and how do we recover our health systems and baking that in to a long-term pandemic resilience response plan. Um, so I agree that this is going to take a lot of partnership and Metro, of course, needs to be uh, one of the leading figures in that work. And Cameron, you touched on my next question and, and you're the first one to go on, on this oh, great. one. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, an economic recovery, what role can or should Metro play in helping the overall region um, dig out from this economic crisis? That's uh, the perfect question, Helen. What we are dealing with is another economic crisis. We dealt with this in 2008. Uh, the reality, the hard reality that all of us are gonna have to face is that we are not gonna go back to what things were like two and three months ago. Our society has been changed forever. Um, and in many ways that's sad, but one of the things that I've been talking about since I ran, uh, since I started running for this position is the analogy of a forest fire. Uh, forest fires are devastating and we lose so much from a forest fire. But at the same time, when that fire is gone, the soil is fertile and more diversity comes into this area and there is opportunity for new things to grow. Uh, we are seeing this happen right now. Businesses that are closing their doors forever. Uh, people who will have to change complete uh, job career and career trajectories that they, were, that they were previously on. It is sad that 
these changes happened without any preparation, without any choice. Uh, but the reality is, is that we are resilient as a people. We have gone, gotten past recessions and depressions before. It's not gonna be easy, but we have to emerge from this period with the belief that we can do it. That first and foremost is the thing that's gonna get us to where we need to be. And so that's where I would be as a, a personal Metro counselor to remind us that we can overcome the challenges that we face today. Metro specifically needs to really be able to leverage the role that it's done so successfully as our unique regional government, as a convener, as a, a government that provides expertise around research and data collection. We need to start evaluating, you know, we have some information about the industries that were hurt the most. What's going to take to get them back online? What kind of resources do we need to put into that? Um, how does that impact transportation? How does that impact our health systems? How does it impact our, our venues and our public spaces? Uh, these are big conversations. And what we've seen with this pandemic is that this is not something that is just to one city or county. Uh, Metro really can play that role in facilitating that bigger dialogue, how we were all impacted and how do we emerge together to get our economy back to where it needs. And so I don't have all of the answers. We are all waiting to see what is the actual fallout, but Metro right now needs to be ready to emerge into a role, providing, helping to provide solutions. Um, and that's, the, as Metro counselor, I will be there. Uh, my background is in economics. I have an economics degree from here at Portland State University. And we need to be working with our universities too. We need to be working with the uh, folks who understand our economy and to help make those conversations and to, as we continue to, to do the work of Metro, figure out where our future investment's gonna be. Uh, ultimately, the convening part is the most important, but I believe the data and the research mm -hmm. and then funding and priorities in the future, Metro needs to be at the table and we need to really lean into that work. Thank you. And I believe, uh, Nolan, you're next in the order. Okay. I'm more of a concrete, tangible, um, measurable kind of gal. Um, and what I think Metro can do to help the region lift itself out of this disaster, um, both uh, medically, health-wise, but most particularly the economic um, devastation that is happening and probably and almost certainly hasn't peaked, is Metro needs to really exert itself to promote the regional goals of prosperity, interconnectedness, and keep in mind livability. Um, we know that infrastructure projects, infrastructure investments are a fabulous economic stimulus tool. And Metro has the capacity to really leverage that. Metro already has approval from voters for an affordable housing bond measure and an open spaces and parks um, measure. We'll talk, I'm sure, at some point during this conversation about Metro's ambitions for a transportation package. So I won't jump too far ahead into that, although I have thoughts about that. Um, Metro isn't leveraging the capacity for uh, job creation through its affordable housing measure. And um, that might have been okay when it was approaching it in the world of, oh, say, you know, January 2020, but it's not okay anymore. Uh, Metro has approved projects in that measure um, that come in with price tags closing in on $400,000 per housing unit. Um, I don't consider that affordable housing in my uh, definition of that term, and it and by doing projects like that, Metro does two things. First of all, I think it spills resources into projects that it doesn't need to do. And I would play a role of more tight um, overseer from a council point of view and really work with the Metro auditor um, about whether those uh, grants and, and uh, allocations are getting the value that they could be. But it's not just the dollars. If you spend $400,000 building a, an affordable housing unit where the private sector can deliver that same value, that same resource for about $200,000, a clean, 
uh, well-equipped, well-located, affordable housing, home or apartment, then Metro is only building half as many as it should be. If it spends twice as much on each one, it obviously can only build half as many. That puts people at risk and, it's, and it jeopardizes their ability to have the residential, the home stability that it takes to get and keep a job. The other thing Metro has in its toolkit is its role in coordinating land use planning around the region. Now, a big part of that role is around urban growth boundary and implementation of the statewide land use goals that include everything from farmland to livability to air quality to um, transportation coordination. Um, but because Metro has that regional convening capacity, and given the urgency of doing something significant, I think Metro has an opportunity to use that authority and that convening role to really get local governments, local partners, the counties, and particularly the cities that are really more engaged in um, building standards and building codes to revisit whether we have policies in place at the cities that promote construction of affordable homes, uh, realistic commercial and retail sites, um, or are we again asking people who are providing those services to leave money on the table or in the ground or on some um, shall we say overzealous code requirement that reduces their capacity to provide square footage for retail space or for commercial space or industrial space or units for residential. Um, and I, those are things that Metro can do right now and will have direct immediate impact on the resuscitation of the economy through infrastructure construction and job creation. Great, thank you. And Mary, um, in, in terms of uh, what Metro can do, what role can and should it play in helping rebuild the economy? Um, can you give me some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, I think that um, uh, Metro has such an opportunity to be a convener um, of, of you know, region-wide interests. In fact, you know, its charter, its preamble says that it really is designed to be the convener of all the jurisdictions and bring and bubble up community solutions and ideas. And so I don't think there's ever been a bigger opportunity to do that. And I think it's really critical that we are speaking to everybody and we're speaking to authentic voices in our communities that are both part of the economic growth um, as well as the folks that are employed um, and and uh, all facets. I'm a bit disheartened, honestly, at the state level that small businesses are being left out of the conversation on the, you know, kind of economic stimulus package as, as we, we talk about taking care of businesses. I think Metro has, a, a, frankly, a responsibility to ensure because small businesses are such a key uh, part of our economic um, fabric and community in the region that we make sure that those voices come to the table and we're, we're talking to all those businesses. Um, because there's a whole lot less disparity between the top and bottom in a smaller business and a local business than there are in a lot of the big industries. And so I think that um, those voices are really critical to be listening to. Um, Metro, I think again, has an opportunity with its own workforce. I think that there was a great lost opportunity with the last recession um, that we experienced that certainly wasn't as devastating as what we're looking and facing today, um, but that was pretty devastating and, and pretty disruptive that we didn't look at models where you know, worker first and labor first in terms of keeping folks employed um, as the key priority. And I think that this gives us the opportunity to revisit that as an economic model, that we, we don't look to traditional trickle-down economics to you know, put all the money at the top and assume it's gonna come down into the economy. It didn't after the last recession. We still were left with bigger disparities, bigger income disparities, 
And that causes all the other disruptive problems in our region of affordability of housing and of the livability of our communities. So I think we have a huge opportunity. I, I agree with um, Nolan. I'm not as familiar with using that as your name, Mary, but um, with uh, I agree with her point about you know these investments, these big public investments. I mean, we have centuries, you know, at least a century of of experience where these big public investments, like a transportation package, like the housing bond, can be part of really important part of um, economic stimulus. I just want to make sure that we're convening though. Um, uh, and we're talking with folks so that we make sure we're not cutting corners on our values and we're not trying to grab easy and quick money um, while compromising. Because if we really use these economic stimulus opportunities that the transportation package could represent and the housing bond measure does already represent, these could be huge opportunities to really leapfrog forward to also meet our community needs and meet the urgency of the climate crisis, which is a still an existing crisis in our midst um, that, you know, honestly, this pandemic has demonstrated the vulnerability of our communities because of the underlying problems of the environment and the climate. Um, you know, communities with higher air pollution are actually experiencing higher rates of infection of the virus. So these, are, these aren't separate issues. They're all part of what um, what our communities are facing. And so we have the opportunity to use these investments um, to actually also address some of our most entrenched problems. And I see that as, as Metro has the unique capacity and capability to convene that conversation that almost no other uh, entity does that can also be very relevant to lived experiences and and convene real conversation around those those topics and so I see a huge opportunity for Metro to lead on that conversation about leading with a community first economic stimulus package okay thank you um, think about that real quick you know actually um, uh, if you could save save that, because I'd like to move into transportation next. And actually, Laura's got got a question on that. Um, I want to kind of be mindful of time. We've got about 20 minutes left, um, and want to hit a few key things. So, if Cameron, if you wouldn't mind kind of holding that, and you can just tack that on to the beginning of your your uh, yeah. answer. Okay. Um, and Laura, do you want to ask? And I think this goes to Nolan now. Right. Great, thank you. Yeah, we had a, a question about whether or not you feel that Metro should proceed with the transportation measure this year, uh, considering what we're facing in terms of the economy. And if so, do you think it would be smart to scale back the, the measure to be less than $7 billion? Um, important question. One I am spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, Given what I understand now about what Metro is contemplating, and that's, that's a significant qualifier because we don't know what the funding mechanism will be. And I think that's critical in deciding whether to move forward at all. Um, really important that we address that. Um, secondly, we have some sense, and it's a pretty developed sense of what the projects would be, or at least the 13 corridors, with some specificity about the individual projects in there. I don't think it's finalized. I think Metro has an obligation to the voters to really address those two items in a public, really transparent way before it puts, refers anything to the ballot on transportation. And I'll talk a bit more about that briefly, but to be clear, because you ask direct questions and deserve direct answers, if we can address those issues, and if, if the Metro Council does address them, then I think the timing actually is something I would support. And largely that is driven by the need, um, congestion, air quality, um, uh, freight transit through the region, within and through the region are all important. Um, but it's also because in reality, if Metro is well poised to move forward with important projects that should be built, and there is state matching funds, we know state matching funds available for some of those projects, federal funds already available, plus those that could be available and likely will be through 
the disaster relief legislation at the federal level. I think um, getting something that is really good, maybe not perfect the way I would have designed it, is worth doing. Um, and the, the qualifications are important though. I do think the funding mechanism needs to be addressed and I think it needs to be part of an overall evaluation of the capacity of the region and the taxpayers to contribute to, to support and pay for um, important services and facilities. Um, and whether it has a net regressive or progressive impact on the way we pay taxes in the region. Um, and those are two things that are very easy to measure. Um, if Metro doesn't have the talent to do it, um, the state uh, legislative revenue office does, and I would urge them to do that. Um, the other factor is the, the list of projects. I think this is a different world. And the projects that were identified, the corridors that were identified, were identified over the course of the last 15 to 18 months under the screen, under the evaluation tool of life in 2019, commuting in 2019, telecommuting, work from home, Zoom meetings instead of in-person meetings. Um, what's what what is going to happen to retail um, part of that project is to build a light rail line to a shopping mall will we even have shopping malls five years from now let alone 10 years from now and i know it's a compressed timetable um, but metro has the opportunity to address both the funding issue the progressivity of that funding issue and whether the, met, the, the target investments really fit to a post COVID-19 world before it refers it out. If it can successfully address those, and if there's a funding mechanism that is both adequate, raise enough money, progressive, and supported by a majority of the voters, then I think Metro should refer it in November. Thank you. Um, Mary Pivato. So this is such an interesting question today because I had significant reservations about the transportation package um, as it was moving forward. Uh, and so today there's only more reason to have reservations about moving forward on something that has such a huge price tag. Um, my reservations, I mean, some of what Nolan mentioned, um, congestion, air quality, livability, all were, you know, written out as intentions of the transportation package to address. And the transportation package falls very short on all of those things. It doesn't decarbonize in any meaningful way our region. Transportation is the single biggest contribution um, to our carbon, our greenhouse gases, and our air pollution in the region. So I would, that was part of my excitement and, and interest and motivation to run for Metro Council was the idea of being, having a seat at the table on transportation decisions um, because I'm very concerned about the climate crisis and our air quality. And so I, um, you know, already there was no reason to spend you know, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars on a, a, a TriMet, a public transportation system on the Southwest Corridor that was connecting to a mall. So even in 2019, there wasn't a reason to do that. Um, the Southwest Corridor has significant needs for, from public transportation. The Southwest Corridor needs to get, we need to give a viable public transit option that takes cars off the road. Going to the mall is not going to do that. That we might move people who are on a bus onto a light rail, but we're not moving because we're not connecting the biggest uh, commute destinations, which is OHSU and um, uh, the community college, Portland Community College, to a Southwest Corridor um, uh, transportation investment. And so that makes no sense because our, our public transit investments have got to start to be tied directly to increasing ridership, taking cars off the road. That 40% of um, you know, the problems of carbon, the, the contribution of carbon and greenhouse gases, 
means that if we're going to meet our 2050 goals and get 80% decarbonization in our region, we have got to make sure that public transit gives, a, gives people who are currently driving cars a reasonable option that gives them the frequency they need, gives them the connectivity they need, takes them to where they want to go within a reasonable amount of time. And I think that every single TriMet project that's funded should have a metric of increased ridership. And unfortunately, TriMet was able, even within the context of this um, transportation package, to put forward a 2% ridership growth projection for the next 10 years. We're looking at triple digit population growth. We are going to have more congestion, more cars on the road, more carbon, and more air quality problems at the end of that 10 years if TriMet doesn't hold their weight. So I'm, it's really difficult for me to, to support as an air quality and as a climate, as, as, as these being my driving issues to support a package that isn't holding its weight on the contribution it's making to those problems. And, and it's a real missed opportunity. And, you know, again, this pandemic, we're seeing how much transportation contributes to our air quality and our carbon because we're seeing the value of reduction right now. Um, we're seeing huge drops in air pollution and carbon in our atmosphere. Um, and so I hope that this becomes an ideal that we decide, okay, we're going to rebuild, but let's try and disconnect these things. Let's try and break the index of, of, of you know, air pollution and, and carbon and our transportation system. How can we rebuild without having to go back to our 2019 standards? So I'm, I would really like us to see, I would really like us to use this opportunity as a massive rethink about what this transportation package can deliver on and how we can ensure that it also builds a world-class public transit system that give people a reasonable option um, to not drive in their cars. Thank you. Um, Cameron, how about you? Thanks, Helen. So first, I wanted just to go back to my previous thought. Um, it was mentioned earlier of, about the transportation package being a uh, uh, transportation uh, measure being a stimulus package, and that that bothered me. And so the purpose of a stimulus package is that it can create a positive shock to our economy. And in order for a stimulus package to be effective, it has to be big enough and it has to be fast. The reality with this transportation package, this has been planned for two years time. And if voters approve it, which I hope they do, uh, it, most of that funding is gonna be held up by permitting, purchasing and planning. And we don't live in a perfect world where we have the contractors, subcontractors, and materials to even get most of these pro and all these projects at once be done in one or two years. And so uh, I don't. I think we are losing out on the imagination and the actual action and leadership we need to bring if we are thinking of that as the economic stimulus. We need to have that real conversation about economic stimulus, but we can't conflate something that's been worked on for two years um, that has a much different purpose. And so uh, about the transportation measure itself, um, I really applaud uh, Metro's track record and being able to bring together diverse stakeholders to uh, look at some of the mo our most challenging and complex issues. Transportation is the best one. Um, and working with progressive activists in Portland to folks out at the edge of the urban growth boundary um, to bring together uh, a measure that, you know, $7 billion to fund, in my opinion, one of the most progressive transportation measures in uh, history is a big deal. Uh, so that was my feelings about the measure before the pandemic. And we all know that we are entering into a new world. Uh, and this is a, a crucial time to examine how do we move forward? And that means all the things that we were doing, you know, our campaigns are a great example. You know, we were planning on knocking 25,000 doors, you know, by May 19th. And we said, we have to stop and reevaluate everything. That transportation package definitely needs to be reevaluated. Uh, we need to uh, really ensure that we uh, keep our promise to not cause undue burden to working families. We need to know what that mechanism for funding is going to be. Um, and still, even with that, uh, the question still is, you know, is a $7 billion price tag right for 
how we feel as a community, how we feel what we can afford. Um, and so we do need to examine project by project what still fits and what doesn't. Um, I don't have all the answers. Uh, personally, one of the projects that I would like to have an active conversation about is uh, purely based on planning, and that's planning for the you know, max line to be buried under the limit. Uh, we need to have, especially conversations on the planning projects, uh, but we need to look at every individual project in a short window to decide um, if this is really what voters wanna be supporting right now. Um, and so this is a challenging conversation. Again, we have for decades been having conversations and really wanting to see visionary action on transportation investments. I'm so glad it's happening. I believe that our economy is gonna keep moving forward and we need to keep showing that we are doing the right thing with the collaboration and the work that we have done. Uh, but that does mean that we have a duty to examine this current package and to, to make sure that uh, it does uh, provide the support to our community without causing any unattended consequences. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, I want to see if Amy or Therese, do you want to jump in with something? Not I, thank you. Okay, how about you, Amy? Um, I do have a quick question, um, or I ho hopefully we can get through it quickly. So there's a recurring argument about whether Metro has been too tight-fisted in expanding the UGB, which some people contend has hurt housing affordability. What's your view on how Metro has handled past UGB expansions, and would you have made different decisions? And I think we start with Mary Pivoto this time. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, a core issue for anybody joining the Metro Council, since that was one of the fundamental roles of Metro in the region. Um, you know, my sense is that we have a very strong process in place and that the evaluation of that, that, that requirement for evaluation about both what we, you know, the capacity we have today, but what we have to plan for the future. And I think that the process in place is fairly strong. I you know, I understand and I, I take on, I, ideologically, I'm, I, I, I want a low growth in the region. I, I, it's a huge um, value and ideal that I have about, you know, that what we've done right in this region is to not allow the sprawl. But I also understand that the requirement of Metro is to consider when growth is needed to accommodate for population growth. I would like to see Metro, in order to move forward on this conversation, to, and to address the concerns of folks who see this as, as being too restrictive, to again, you know, come back to that role of convener and ensure that we're providing consistent and very accurate data across the region about the current land use. And are we maximizing the land use within the current urban growth boundary? And, and without that data existing, and it doesn't exist consistently, it exists in certain pockets, um, I don't think that we can really make an evaluation ever if we need to, to expand until we know exactly how the, the current land is being used and if it's being max, the use is being maximized. I don't think that, um, I don't share the concern that that has been the affordability issue. We see, you know, we see um, communities up and down the West Coast um, that allow for tons of sprawl that have seen the same types of you know, unaffordability exploding in their in their regions. I, I don't think I think it actually um, uh, again is our biggest strength and our and I want to protect also the fact that we have really important land that we are protecting outside of the growth boundary by by doing that. So so I want to um, I would just ask that we convene better data, more consistent data region wide, so that we are giving a strong answer when we say, no, we don't need to expand. We're, it's evidence-based and it's an understanding of the current land use. Thank you. Um, Cameron, and do you need Amy to, to re, uh, repeat the nope, question? No, I got it. Okay. I, love house, I love talking housing policy. So uh, I initially, I was one of the first cohort members of 1,000 Friends of Oregon's uh, Land Use Leadership Institute. And you know they drew they drove us out to the urban growth boundary, and I got to see firsthand and really appreciate the true treasure that uh, we have as a region protecting 
farm and forest land, and also ensuring that we are planning smartly for the growth that inevitably is coming to our community. Um, that being said, we are dealing with a housing crisis. It is obvious. And we have to look at this through a lens of not just the cost of housing, we have to make sure that our communities and our families are not transportation burdened as well. We have to look at both of these things together. Uh, and that's one of my big concerns. We talk about expanding the urban growth boundary. Um, what if a mom has to move out there and she can't afford gas to go to the grocery store? So there needs to be a bigger conversation about if we're expanding the urban growth boundary, what's that doing with transportation costs? What's that gonna do for having to invest in system development, pipelines and electrical grids and things like that? So it's a much more nuanced conversation than just the land. Uh, Metro you know, has reevaluated its process of how to bring in land to the UGB. That's important. Uh, we need to be a lot, you know, very responsive and transparent about our buildable lands inventory. Very important. Uh, the reality is, is that we need to have that big conversation about the housing shortfall. We are lacking 80,000 units of affordable housing. Uh, I am a, a big champion for uh, actually bringing solutions for diverse housing options. Uh, the reality is, is that we have an aging population, a growing population, and a population that is more diverse than ever. And so, uh, so many of folks who need housing are not looking for big multi-bedroom units. They need single residential units. And we do not have the diversity of housing that is meeting the need in this area. And so we have a new landscape and a new opportunity that we are facing uh, with the passage of House Bill 2001, House Bill 2003. None of our jurisdictions are really ready for the changes that this legislation is bringing. It needs leadership. Metro should be that leadership. We need to be doing work around uh, our planning and development department to make sure that we have the staffing and capacity to convene and to actually develop an effective, actionable, affordable housing plan. And that affordable housing plan needs to be driving the conversation around, do we need to expand the UGB or not? Because the reality is, is that we might have to. We have 80,000 units we need to build. And if the plan does not say that, we need to be looking at all of the options. First place that I would look, because I believe we need to preserve the, and conserve the, the natural area outside of the Tri-County region, but we have cities in this area that have their own miniature UGBs. We need to be talking to them and asking them if they are pulling their fair weight. Um, and so that would be the, the broader conversation. It's a, a complex issue. Uh, I believe that there's a huge amount of opportunity to build densely and smartly, and so that folks can really enjoy the benefits of the community that we have here. Uh, but at the same time, uh, ultimately, we need to keep the conversation open around how does the urban growth boundary impact our affordable housing uh, priorities. Thank you. And Nolan. Thanks. Um, and I'm going to uh, take the uh, candidate's privilege to go back and briefly address Laura. I had promised you a direct and specific answer, and I left part of it out on the transportation package. You asked about timing and size of the package, and I, I think there, Metro has a significant opportunity now to resize the package of what it plans to refer out and to define very specific objectives that it will deliver how much reduction in congestion, how, how much faster will commute times be, how much faster will freight uh, through transit as well as within the region be, and how much will air quality improve. And maybe do a, a smaller, say half the package, use the projects that are ready to go now to deliver on those results, tell the voters, this is what we'll deliver for you, and if we do, we'll come back and ask for your trust to do more. So I would change the size and um, the definitions of success um, that Metro puts out. Now um, to the question about uh, the urban growth boundary and housing affordability. I think there's a link there, but I think it's not the most important link in affecting affordability of housing. Um, I am open. I, Mary correctly points out that Metro has an obligation to review every six years uh, whether we have a 20-year supply of land within the urban growth boundary, um, the single ur urban growth boundary for the whole region. Um, I'm not sure what Cameron's referring to with mini UGBs because Metro has authority for the, in 
for the single UGB for the entire region. We have an obligation. We should do it. Metro has a solid process for evaluating that. Um, what Metro doesn't have a solid process for yet, and I would like to bring to the council, is a way to weave together all of the tools in Metro's box and all of the statewide land use goals to address the supply of land available to meet the projected need. And what I mean by that is, um, it's not just a matter of having additional land and theoretically cheaper land because it's further away from economic centers. It is a matter of how you connect within the entire region, the uses of either land already in the UGB or land that you'd consider for adding. If there is an issue, as Cameron mentioned, about uh, transportation uh, costs for people who might uh, move into new housing that's on the fringes and therefore theoretically less expensive. The best way to address that is to use Metro's authority to influence the local land use and zoning um, plans for the, the cities and counties so that there are connections between residential development and job development, whether that's retail or commercial, so that we both reduce the distances people need to travel to get to work. We, of course, as I mentioned earlier, should take into account whether people will not be commuting to jobs at the same pace that we saw in the 2010s, maybe adjust for the 2020s and the 2030s about what commute traffic uh, patterns will be. Um, but also, Metro has authority over how, uh, has influence, not direct authority, but they have influence over the infrastructure plans and capital development, uh, capital construction plans of the cities. And Metro should tie both with carrots and with sticks expectations that the local cities do their share of affordable housing, um, uh, middle class job creation, um, educational siting. Let's don't put schools outside of the urban growth boundary just because the land is cheaper and that then induces ex exponential growth in the residential areas out there. Um, I think the biggest issues around affordable housing have really to do with the local government building codes, zoning codes, and restrictions there that make it difficult to build the kind of housing that really is affordable to working class and middle class folks. And that's where Metro really has the capacity to leverage its influence and its authority on the local, local cities. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, that has been a full hour and that's been a really, it's been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate just everything that all of you brought to this. Um, I think we don't really have time for any, any final statements, but um, we'll be coming out with our endorsement toward the end of the month or uh, beginning of May. Um, and uh, we'll follow up with you if we have any additional questions, but thank you so much for making your time available for us today. Thank you. Thanks for convening. Thank be yeah. safe. Thank you so much. You Thanks too. for your participation. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.